Today we tackle the bane of many physics students. This one is the Tilted Atwood machine. What are we doing? Okay, so the tilted Atwood machine, just like many other Atwood machine variants that we see in physics, is two blocks connected by a string that runs over some sort of pulley. Now this pulley, for now, today, has no mass and no friction on it. That's something we'll cover later on further into physics. These two blocks consist of one block which is sitting on a frictionless hill. If you want to make this problem more complicated, you put friction on the hill. Again, we'll tackle that later. This block has some mass. It's connected by a string that runs parallel to the hill, up over the pulley, and that string hangs down the other side of the pulley to a block over here. We'll say this block has some mass M2. Now, you typically won't see this done in variables, but we're gonna do this today in variables so you see how each individual block affects the outcome. And what we should have when we get all done is a function that can be used to determine the acceleration of these two blocks. All we would need to do is input the individual masses. Now there's one thing that we are gonna to need to know additionally, not just the two masses, but also we need to know the value for that angle of the hill. So we're going to assign this angle theta to the angle of the hill, and we'll be using that in our derivation. Now this is an Atwood machine, uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to apply Newton's second law to each block individually. By doing that, we'll be able to then combine those formulas or functions that we get from the individual blocks and hopefully come up with a solution for this acceleration of the entire system. So, let's look at this block on the hill first. We know gravity is going to act downward on this block. This is the weight of the block. The force by gravity is the mass of the block times acceleration due to gravity. There are other forces on this block as well. We know the normal force is going to be acting on the block. Now remember, the normal force is always perpendicular to the plane of intersection between two surfaces. In this case, those two surfaces are this block and this hill. There's a third force, and that force is this tension in the cable. That tension is going to act upward or up the hill on the block. Once we have these three forces, we can now try to apply these forces acting on the block to Newton's second law. So we're going to look at block number one here. And apply all the forces to Newton's second law. Now what we don't want to do is just go adding up all three forces and saying that's the sum of all forces. Because that's not what we're talking about here. That's not how we would correctly apply Newton's second law. The correct way to apply Newton's second law is to look at this block and think about in what direction is this block going to go. Now we don't know if the block is going to be pulled up the hill because of this block, or if it's going to have enough weight to be going down the hill. But what we do know is this block is going to move in the plane of the hill. It makes no sense that this block would sort of tunnel down through this ramp. That would just be silly. So what we're worried about when we try to apply Newton's second law is we want to think about the forces and more importantly, the components of forces that are parallel to the hill. Now it's easy enough to see that this tension in the string is parallel to the hill. But what about the other two? Well, the normal force by definition is perpendicular to the hill. So it has no component parallel to the hill. Weight, on the other hand, we're going to have to take a little bit closer look at this. To do this, 
rather than trying to cram a lot of drawing in right here. We're gonna do this over here. We'll redraw the block on the hill, but a whole lot bigger. So now we have this block on the hill. Show the weight, M1G. And the normal force. Tension is acting up the hill. Now we've already discussed the tension and the normal force and how they relate to Newton's second law and how they act within the plane of the hill, or in the case of the normal force, don't act within the plane of the hill. The weight, however, this has a component both parallel to the hill and perpendicular to the hill. I want you to realize when we look at the parallel and perpendicular components of the weight, what we're left with is a right triangle. It's important to recognize this angle right here is the same as this angle right here. It's a big misconception. Some people try to put this angle up here, and they say this angle is the same as this angle down here. And that's not true. What that means is this component parallel to the hill, something we'll often call the force down the hill, even though it's not really a force, it's simply a component, is equal to not m1g, but m1g sine theta. Realize this is just the opposite side of this right triangle, where the hypotenuse is the weight of the block. So once we've figured out how large the force down the hill is, now we can look at the forces within the plane of the hill. We have tension up the hill, and we have the component of gravity parallel to the hill acting downward. We're calling it the force down. Applying these forces to Newton's second law, we get T minus... FD is equal to M1A. And if we expand this term out, we have T minus M1G sine theta equals M1A. This equation is Newton's second law applied to this block. Here we have the sum of all forces, mass, and acceleration. We're going to do the same thing for this hanging block over here, and it's considerably simpler to look at the hanging block than it is to look at this block on the hill. It's this block on the hill that confuses people the most. This hanging block, it's not too hard to deal with. We have the weight of the block, Fg, is the mass, m2, times the acceleration due to gravity. We have the tension acting upward. This tension and this tension have the same value. And that is because this pulley is massless, this pulley has no friction, and the string we're saying has no mass. Those are all things that are, would complicate this problem, but because we've made those concessions, the tension on both ends of the string are going to be equal. Now we have to be very careful here, because we have to worry about sine. You'll notice when we talked about the block on the hill, we made the tension up the hill positive and the force down the hill negative. They're competing against each other. And what we did here was we effectively established a positive direction up the hill. Tension was positive, force down the hill. It was competing against that, so we said it was negative. That happened right here. But which way needs to be positive here? If we've set up the hill here as positive, the fact of the matter is that needs to be positive, and I'll explain why. If this block was to move one meter up the hill, this block would move downward one meter. The motion of these two blocks is connected, literally connected by a string. And so if this one moves in one direction, this moves in a corresponding direction. The uphill motion of one block corresponds to the downward motion of this block. So if I say uphill is positive here, that means downward is positive for this other block. 
So in looking at this second block, we need to be a bit careful about the signs. Here we actually have the weight is positive. We're gonna have the tension is negative because it is acting upward. And for this block over here, upward is the negative direction. That's gonna equal M2A. Again, we just have the sum of all forces equals MA. Now we have two equations. And all we need to do is just a little bit of algebra in order to come up with our original goal. And that is an expression that will tell us the acceleration of this entire system. To do that, I'm going to rearrange this equation right here for T. I'm going to take this function, I'm going to substitute it in right there. We're just doing two equations with two unknowns, just like in math class. Do this over here. And we'll clean this up a little bit. Moving all the A's to one side. And what we're left with now is again, Newton's second law. You'll notice over here, we have the forces acting externally on the system. We have the weight of one block and the force down the hill on the other. We don't include tension here. You'll notice once we looked at the entire system, the tension canceled itself out because tension's in the negative direction on one block and the positive direction on the other. So tension doesn't show up here in our solution. We simply have the net force on the system. Over here on the other side, we have the total mass and the acceleration of the system. So to solve for the acceleration, all we need to do is just rearrange our function a little bit more. And this is the solution to the tilted outward machine. What you'll notice about this is this solution reduces down to some of the other forms of the Atwood machine or some of the other versions of the Atwood machine, which we have solved for. If I was to take this hill and make it steeper and steeper and steeper until it was straight up and down 90 degrees, this block would simply be hanging from the string. If this was 90 degrees, this solution reduces down to the solution we have for the hanging Atwood machine. Conversely, if I was to take this hill and make it so it was level or parallel with the horizontal axis, this angle would reduce down to zero. We would see this term right here would go to zero. And what we would be left with is simply M2G over the sum of all masses. That is the solution to the basic outward machine. So here it is, the tilted outward machine. If you understand this problem, you can do most versions of the Atwood machine until we start throwing friction and pulling mass into the situation. And that's all for now.